But start off, please, by just introducing yourself, starting with you, please, Rahila, and moving along. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Rahila. I work at Yahoo, and uh, great to be here. I'm Miff Tranch. I work for a and Digital Services, also known as AdOps and AdTech. And again, it's great to be here and I'm really excited about this panel. Hi, I'm Keaton. I've uh, been in, in the industry for about 11 years. Um, publisher, ad tech, agency, um, yeah, data, you name it. Well, were you one of our mentees, Keaton, back in the day? Yes, yeah, James oh. Bayes. Yeah, I don't know if he's here, but um, yeah, that was, a, that was a good, that's a good course. <laughs> Thank you very much. We'll talk a bit more about that later, but you can talk about his experience as a mentee. We are looking for mentors, and we will talk about that later, but I'm already uh, digressing. Um, look, Rahila, let's start by jumping straight into some of those specifically programmatic practices um, that you could share, just in terms of just good advice for reducing programmatic campaign emissions. Absolutely. Uh, just before that, I'm going to start with a study that I came across um, while I was doing my research. So there's this company in France by the name of 55. They are a digital strategy company. And what they did was that they ran a test campaign um, from start to finish, which included the production of creative, building the creative, activating all the different channels. And what they discovered was that from start to finish, the amount of resources that were used in that campaign are equivalent, wait for this, to 160 flights between Sydney and Bali. So that's how serious this is. Um, all right, now that I have your attention, <laughs> I'm going to jump into some of the um, things that we can do with our programmatic campaigns. So the first one that I want to talk about is green PMPs. This is a direct to publisher relation um, where you basically have a lower impact. There's a lower impact on the auction, but then also the carbon offset is low because of that reason. The publishers that are included in this are publishers that are carbon neutral. You do pay a little bit of a premium on that inventory, but because it's ultimately cleaner inventory, you get better results for your campaigns. Um, we at Yahoo are quite passionate about sustainability, so this is something that we are actively uh, doing and uh, offering to our clients, curated a list of publishers um, that are carbon neutral. And uh, yeah, this is offered as one of the solutions at Yahoo. Mm -hmm. The next one I'm gonna talk about is a very straightforward one, but still important. So uh, always, whenever you set up your PMPs, make sure that you ask for the flow bids. The reason is because you will never then uh, be a part of a bid that you don't qualify for. So there's no wastage. The third one is multi-hop impressions. So as the name suggests, it is essentially hopping from one uh, reseller to another to another. You can imagine this does impact, um, the, leaves a big carbon footprint, but not just that, every reseller in this hopping process is get, taking a bit for um, a bit of a cut. So by the time that impression gets to you, um, you're paying that premium. Um, and essentially it's not a cleaner path, but then also you're paying more for that uh, impression that you could potentially have gone direct with. So one of the initiatives is ads.text. It's a very simple solution. What you do there is that you act, uh, uh, essentially use that to qualify resellers that are uh, making enough of a revenue contribution to be a part of your supply path. Um, not just that, you can also always opt into that PMP option that I spoke about. And uh, further to that, you can always go direct if that's something that you choose. Mm -hmm. Um, the last one is ad verification. Mm -hmm. So with ad verification, if I know that a lot of us are now not just focusing on last click or how did we get that conversion, but we also look at other metrics such as attention, such as viewability. So if those are things that you want to um, tap into, try and cap it to one vendor. Do not use three vendors for viewability, three for attention and so on, because that would leave a, a bigger carbon footprint. Um, a great initiative by IAB is the um, uh, Open Measurement SDK. You can always tap into that. Publishers need to tap into that. But what that does is that there's just the one SDK 
and all of the vendors can just use that SDK. And um, it's, it's transparent because it's open source. At the same time, you're leaving less of that carbon footprint. So there you have it. <laughs> Thank you very much. There's a good set of IB recommendations right there, Rahila. Thank you very much. Um, so just to build upon that a little bit, um, and Mif, I know you work on both sides of the fence, as it were, and um, you know I'm definitely older than you, but you, know, you you've been working in our industry for for a while now, and some of those traditional processes, particularly say on publisher adopts teams that um, I did refer to them a little bit in the um, intro. Do you have any just recommendations in terms of just good process so that publishers can just enable more efficient ad campaigns and ensure that's part of their standard um, routines? Sure can, thanks JJ. Um, what I really think is there are lot, so many existing processes we can just tweak a little bit that will then lead to sustainability improvements. So the ongoing review of everything that you're dealing with, so review the ads on your site, review where your inventory is filled, re review where it isn't filled, look at where you're running house ads all the time, review your partners, have a look, are they giving you what they said they would give you? Mm. Are you making the money? Are you getting the right sort of ads? Review your user experience. Actually sit there on your website as a user and say, what am I doing on this page that is actually making the experience better or worse for our users? And actually really think about those these are the things that they're so little, but they make such a big difference. And while you're reviewing it, don't forget your international visitors. So many of us have partners with international sellers, and so we're selling all our international inventory, and we don't look at it. It's just totally out of sight, out of mind. So pop on your VPN, have a look, see what the people are seeing from other countries, see if there's things you can be doing better there. I, I love that advice. Yeah, it's well, so obvious. I know, but you've until <laughs> and if you're not working on it every day, you don't yeah. think about it. Yeah. And the other thing to really review is just look at your bid flaws from a programmatic perspective. Actually, look at them, see what they're doing. Are they right? Yeah. And once you've done all that review, you've got a chance to revise and improve. So, can you get rid of ads? Do they need to be there? I know this is sacrilege, but can you make your money? and reach your revenue goals by doing it better. Yeah, I think we've got a lot better as an industry in terms of understanding less is more, initially from the consumer experience, but now increasingly in relation to emissions. And just that advice that you mentioned around like just jumping on a VPN, like you can dig through the reports and see the details of what's running in other geos, but actually to, <laughs> so, so obvious, like why well, you just jump on a VPN and see what your Italian and all your, even, I don't know, US, UK traffic's actually looking like, manually verify it, that is quite interesting. Well, I know last week I was having a look at something um, for one of our clients and one of their international partners and they're running across a number of markets in Southeast Asia and one ad behaves perfectly in one country but it broke the homepage yeah. of another country. Yeah. And so actually physically seeing what's going on makes all the difference in the world. And also there are sort of some, some, I might call them traditional tools like uh, Charles Fiddler, stuff like that. I think Chrome has got development, developer tools you can actually utilise within the browser that actually dig in and you can, you can uh, verify the outputs from ad calls, at least in sort of milliseconds of downloading a particular ad weight and that sort of thing, so, which I think was just standard process back in the day and I'm not back sure if it's Back in the very, is. very olden days, yeah. Yeah, true, okay, show my age, sorry about that. But anyway, we, I think it's something we may think of actually providing some guidance of um, the more that we've been talking as, as a panel group, something sort of um, been ingesting in my mind to, to work on that with s and and perhaps this panel around some of that advice, even if it is really old. Um, Keaton, now um, you work as a uh, programmatic growth lead, actually. Not programmatic lead, sorry about that. But just oh, it's a big business. There's a lot, <laughs> there's a lot, <laughs> just a lot of just, different teams. Just yeah. realise that as I'm uh, reading out this question, but... Um, in terms of auction-based programmatic campaigns um, that take, you know, a lot of a lot more effort, as we've realised and as Rahila um, mentioned there, what um, what about SPO? I know we've we've talked about that as a topic for a number of years, but can you just remind us, just in terms of what it is and how it can, and why it can help? Yeah, so I mean, it is a big topic. Like you'd have a whole panel on this. Um, I think Miff and Rahila touched on a few techniques there. Um, and SPO is essentially like the uh, skill set that's really important right now. And um, it's a, the ability to have 
good business relations with vendors that are part of the chain as well as understanding how algorithms work. There's a really good guide from IAB Europe. I don't know if it's been translated to Australia or if it really needs to, but I recommend downloading that. And if, if you follow those steps um, and you follow a good SPO plan, you'll be able to uh, do things like get quality control, econ economic control, um, consolidated innovation. Uh, you'll do things like uh, hol get holistic insights um, and, and a lot of other things like um, buyer leverage as well. So um, if you ask different people inside the chain um, of uh, from buy to sell to supply, um, like an SSP, for example, what SPO is, you know, uh, an SSP might say, oh, well, you know, if you do a deal with us for most of your um, demand, like we'll give you lower take rates. Or, you know, there's a thing at the moment that's trendy called disintermediation, which basically just means companies are starting to uh, apply um, like features that might knock out some other people in, in some intermediaries, such as Magnite's uh, Clearline. Um, or, uh, you know, the trade desk's open path. Uh, open path that is that is not knocking out SSPs, but you just happen to be able to bid on um, pre-bid traffic. Um, but when, you know, when you ask when you ask a DSP, for instance, what, what is SPO, they'll say, um, you know, we've got bid shading algorithms and we've got um, things like uh, uh, automated tech that will look at the supply path object, which is a combination of ads.txt and sellers.json. It kind of just works out the optimal path based on that. Um, yeah. Automation is, is what they love. But if you ask an exchange, they'll say, you run everything through us and um, we like post-optimize the creative so there's more compression on it and, and there's high viewability, et cetera. Um, but I think that like, I know what I'm talking about, a lot of you might just be in ad ops. Um, and so you've probably done SPO in your own life. Um, so if you go shopping and you've actually instead gone direct to the factory, maybe on AliExpress or something like that, and you've knocked out the retailer, you've actually done some SPO in your own personal <laughs> life, um, which, which is true. Um, but, but I know this panel's about sustainability, and so you know, I, can, I can also say that in, in a different lens. You know, you're looking for a sustainable product that's locally made, and you buy something with carbon-free shipping, and all of a sudden you've, you've actually done SPO, but with a different target or a different, a different value that you're trying to apply to that. Um, and that, that does change what you're looking for. So I think there's like a, a few principles just to think about when you're doing SPO uh, for programmatic, uh, where carbon is, is the focus, because there's a lot of vendors out there that have green this, net zero that, you know, things that Tim was saying, there's more regulation coming on board. But underneath that layer is actually foundational things that make it greener. And if you just keep that in mind, um, and I'll, I'll list a couple of them. So one is to, um, is to re reduction in waste. So essentially, uh, every single bid uh, that, that gets added to the process or every single server request needs computational power. And so um, if you streamline that, um, you have less loads on the servers that are being used and therefore less energy being used. Uh, and the second one is improving efficiency. So um, if, you, if you knock out a few intermediaries, um, all of a sudden those servers aren't even becoming part of the um, the process there and the bidding process. So you've streamlined that and saved energy in that regard. Um, and if you follow good SPO, you're also having uh, or fewer failed requests mm -hmm. um, and also there's uh, less um, non-human traffic as well. And failed requests and non-human traffic, they need processing. So what's happening there is they're actually adding no value to the chain at all and they need to be completely eliminated. So following good SPO uh, leads to uh, putting inventory on clean ads.txt sites, um, what was mentioned before. Like, at News, we've done a, a lot of hard work over the years to make our ads.txt file as lean as possible. We only had partners that add value to the chain. Um, you know, there was, there was this rush from publishers when header bidding came along to just add as many uh, uh, SSPs as possible, mm -hmm. um, as much supply. And we didn't go down that path, so we're quite lucky, but there's a lot of people following DPO, which is demand path optimization, just, just looking the other direction, um, just to kind of uh, wind back those decisions. Um, and, you know, I, yesterday or last week, I was looking at um, some long tail sites that would pass hygiene tools, like dictionary.com. I'm sure you've seen that one on some few reports. Um, but you look at the ads.txt file and you scroll down and like a minute later you're still scrolling. Yep. And it's like there's so many resellers on that thing. Um, if you put an ad on that, um, you know, you're firing every single server on that list just to, just to serve one ad. Um, and if that's ten times larger than another site, you've got ten times more energy that you've used for that. 
Um, and, you know, lastly, I'd just like to say, like, um, uh, we do a lot of deals with clients and we say to them, okay, so what SSP or um, what exchange do you prefer? And, you know, quite often we just get, like, oh, it doesn't really matter. But I think it might matter and, and I think that maybe you've done some SPO work in your company before and you might have preferred partners. Um, so maybe after this conference go and ask and say like, yeah, do we have preferred SSPs to, to, you know, for various reasons? Um, and so because we're looking at scope three carbon in path optimization, I, I'm just gonna propose a really nerdy Star Wars acronym we should use instead. All and right. we, we could call it um, C3PO. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. I like that, actually. We're, that's what we could entitle the follow-up to this, because I think we used to, you to pr produce this updates to this information in what we call auction mechanics um, updates. We have stopped that recently, and it did feel like we had to update it every quarter. But I think in relation to any guidance we provide in, in terms of efficiency, I think it's well worth um, including updates in that. And there's a lot of information there, Keen. Thank you. C3PO. Mm. Um, now, switching gears slightly, um, Rahila, we know there are some practices that are becoming more common, um, some specific to products and some, some in just in terms of um, delivery um, or uh, for certainly on ad calls on a page. Can you talk us through both what lazy loading is and adaptive stre streaming for video? Sure. So the concepts that you've spoken about are both around delivering content smartly. Uh, when we talk about lazy loading, think of it as on-demand loading. So when the content is on-demand, meaning in view, that's the only time it's going to load. So anything that is lower in the, on the page, which is not in view, it will only load when you scroll down. Um, what this does is that it uh, makes sure that there uh, is no content that's loaded unnecessarily, so you're saving on that. But not just that, your ads are 100% um, viewable because they will not load until you are actually on that uh, uh, section of the page. The second concept is uh, adaptive streaming. So um, it, it works in a similar way to how a manager will work with a new employee. So I'll give you my example. Uh, when I first joined Yahoo, initially my tasks were very simple, so stuff around look after programmatic campaigns or understand different offerings that we have. Over time, they became more complex, so managing agency groups, for example. And finally, when I settled into my um, role, my tasks kept evolving, but never to the point where it would become overwhelming. So when we talk about adaptive streaming, um, the video player learns what load your connection can take without getting overwhelmed. So if it uh, realizes that your connection is struggling, it's going to uh, load a lower quality uh, video for you, but that means that you can still consume the content, however, the quality of the video will drop. Now, this does not mean that the whole video you have to see watch in that lower quality. The decision is made second to second. So what that means is that as soon as your connection improves, it's going to allow you to tap into that higher quality inventory. So better user experience because the user is not just sitting there waiting for the video to load. They can still consume content, but at the same time, it's not going to load unnecessarily. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to leave you guys with a bonus one, uh, oh. CDNs. Um, they are content delivery networks. So um, a simple way to think about them is web content is placed on different servers in different parts of the world. So if I am requesting some information in Australia, I'm going to be connected to the closest server to me in Australia. I don't have to make giant leaps around the world to get to my content. Um, what that does is that um, um, the uh, data loading back and forth, that's, it's going to reduce, so that means that less processing, less resources required. You can also cache the content so that you don't have to go back and forth too often. Um, importantly, a channel like C, uh, sorry, CTV uh, uses a lot of CDN because there is a lot of streaming. It is in-app content. So um, they, uh, for, to maximize user experience, they do have to work very closely with CDNs. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Like the, the focus there has been consumer experience traditionally, and your view, viewability helped, I think, with some of the common practices, but the technologies are actually related to the consumer experience, but they can be leveraged very highly, obviously, for just 
basic efficiency. Yeah, and, and you can just start leveraging them today yep. if you're not already. Yep. So, yeah. And we will touch upon another sort of feature that we'll see uh, collaboratively through OpenRTB 2.6 uh, that does enable uh, more efficiencies through ad poddings. We will touch upon that in a in a later panel as well. So there are, it, it's good to see those sort of product specific or feature specific um, capabilities rolling out. Now, Mif, we've um, talked a bit about SPO, but in terms of general active advice, I'm now gonna get you to jump on the other side as a buyer. What can, what can buyers do um, fairly quickly? When I started my career, I was working with some very strict publishers and we were really, really strict on file weights when Creative was coming through. And as HTML has rolled out, people are giving us much bigger, bigger files. And as a buyer, it drives me crazy when I get creatives that are massive. There's so much extra in the folder that doesn't need to be there. And if it's all going in there and it's all loading onto the page, it's slowing it down, it's using up more energy, and it drives me crazy. So I think as a buyer, you need to take the time to educate the people building your creative. Mm -hmm. Talk to them about why it's important to keep the creative lean. Encourage the advertiser to A-B test a leaner creative and a heavy creative. See which one's got better viewability, better performance. And really just drive that ongoing improvement because that is absolutely, it's so big. It's an awful user experience. Yep. And it's really crap for the environment. Yep. And the other thing is look at where your ads are going. If you're on the open market, you're going to land on websites made for advertising. And the big red flags are there's ads everywhere. There are more ads than content. You're going to get a random video ad just pop up out of nowhere, maybe two if you're really lucky. Um, the ads are going to just keep refreshing. And I think probably the biggest red flag for me is that the content is 90% of the time lifted from Reddit. Yeah. And so add that one to the blacklist. Don't encourage them. Stop buying it so they stop making it. And I think if we can just keep doing that, we're not going to catch everything. No. But if we can be consistently better, that's better than one of us being perfect. Yeah, we actually need to look, re, 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 oh, hello, review the creative <laughs> guidelines uh, that the SNG um, Council traditionally oversees. That is on our to-do list. We've committed to a timeline on that, and that's something that, that we need to look at um, and distribute and kind of bang the drum on. Um, yeah, and that's a, one of the fears of um, artificial intelligence is just more, more of that automated made for advertising content is just going to keep blowing around. So being vigilant on that is superb advice. Now, Keaton, as I mentioned, you're on our sustainability working group, um, and we've been doing the old lost driver bus thing, uh, lost bus driver. <laughs> Not sure if it's the right analogy, but I'm going to keep I'm going to keep relentlessly bringing it up. Just you know, we're in this together, so helping helping us to guide the bus there. You know, what are some of the issues that could come up as an unintended consequence if we if we just don't align and be consistent um, in terms of what we're looking to achieve as an industry? What are some of the concerns that you might have if we if we are not. Um, so some of the things we've been through before, if, if you wouldn't believe it. So Miff was talking about some things about uh, the size of, of creative. Um, who was here in 2015 working in the industry? Oh, wow, it's half the room. This is great. Very senior room. Um, so you probably remember I, back then I was at Seismic and um, we were entering this phase of like flash to HTML5 and educating creative agencies on... Uh, the, the, the change, so sort of the way Flash worked, and you probably all remember that, is that there were plugins in a browser, and that had all the fonts and browser libraries and everything, and all you needed to transmit um, programmatically was like a small file, and it just called on those libraries. Mm -hmm. um, obviously a big security risk, that's why it was like shut down, but um, all that had to fit into HTML5, and so clients had these expectations of these really big files um, that did all this fancy stuff. And so then you had um, a lot of people doing creative things because the IAB back then still had, I think it was like 80 KB max sizes. Yeah. So um, people were splicing font files to remove characters that weren't even in the copy, doing all these fancy compression algorithms and reusing assets. And so anyone who was around back then probably has some lost art techniques to, to you know, resurface because now it's important for minimizing computational power when you're transmitting uh, large file sizes. Um, but yeah, one thing you mentioned was collaboration. 
And um, I think that's really important in terms of vendors being able to um, share log level data without any uh, hindrance or like putting big prices on that because people need that data in order to collaborate. But, like one example of um, collaboration not working so well when GDPR hit Europe, the uh, SSPs needed to pass like a consent tag to say that you know they've consented and the DSPs would had this thing where they wouldn't bid if the SSP didn't share it and like the SSPs that didn't share that just got no no bids on the on the um, supply so um, some things can go wrong it depends how we structure this new future with carbon and, and just to make sure everything works properly and people work together um, and then uh, lastly we're talking about electricity here at the end of the day um, mainly from coal power plants and then some gas as well and it depends where the servers are located but at the end of the day, we pay an electricity bill. Um, at News, we pay one, but that turns on the lights in the office. Uh, the server that hosts the content might be Amazon um, and a bit of Google, and the uh, like. The analytics is Adobe, and all the ad tech that makes ads appear on our site are servers from hundreds or not hundreds, but tens of different vendors, and they all pay electricity bills um, for their servers, and so. At the end of the day, if they made all of their electricity bills renewable, um, that would go a really long way to uh, making a positive impact. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a good, passionate point. Thank you very much. And I think we're at time. I'm looking for some guidance, but I never really know what's going on. Thank you, Jen. So that means I'm going to ask uh, two more questions. <laughs> Just of, so on a personal point, because I know you brought up the LC3 PO as sort of a bit of a personal statement there, Keaton. I quite like that. Ah, yes. You got another one? Oh, just to end on, um, yeah, okay, so I'd like to just say it's cold outside, right? And we have caveman brains and it's really hard to sort of go and think about the... the, the one analogy is um, you put ice in water and you measure it and the water gets colder, but over a long period of time it's because it's actually getting warmer. And when you look at what we're doing, everything is so transient. We've got one month, three month, 12 month long campaigns, but when CO2 gets put in the air, like 50% of it stays there for a minimum 200 years. So right now we've got CO2 in the air from the year 1823. That's like 50 years before the automobile was invented or before Einstein was born. And so what you can do now um, in your sphere of influence, something Tim said, which is really interesting, is that what you can do now, if you minimise something on a campaign, um, you can make a difference that is that lasts for as long as your kids and your kids' kids generations and don't let anyone say that you can't make a difference in what you're doing. There you go, nice point, which does align with uh, sort of the Tim's vision. Myth? As you very nicely reminded me earlier, I'm old. Not no, as old not, as you. I didn't say that. <laughs> I said I was old and your experience, there's a difference. Um, you said I was nearly as old as you, which is I'm accurate. I'm in trouble with myth, look. <laughs> I'm so old, I remember life before the internet. Computers were just starting in primary school. I remember VIC-20s and Commodore 64s. Yeah. High school, we got excited by Apple IIe's in the computer lab that were a big, big punch on. In the last couple of years of high school is when the internet started rolling out domestically in Australia for me. So having grown up without the internet, and then in 1999, I met DFP, and we've had a love-hate relationship ever since. <laughs> and so I've been lucky enough to have my career evolve as the internet has evolved, but it's just chewing up everything. It's just gobbling every piece of energy we throw at it, it's gobbling it up. And if we don't start to make those little changes now, the impact is going to be massive in the real world, not just the online world where someone goes, oh, these ads take too long to load. Mm. Yeah, but they're also causing things to melt. So it's just looking at our actions and their consequences. Yep, no, it's lovely, I, like, I love it. Rahela? Love what the two guys have said, Keaton and Miff. Uh, from my perspective, I'm going to go back to the stat I started with, the 160 flights. Um, we know that right now when we do book a flight, we have an option of ticking that box that says carbon offset. We don't have that in media as yet. So how can we make our own difference? Um, I think a lot of things discussed today are things that you can go and uh, implement today so why don't we start at that yep. um, collaborate on that um, another thing I'm gonna leave you guys with is I think a lot of you would know this but um, 
one of the things in the scope three's recent document is around 1,000 impressions is equivalent, the resources used are equivalent to a load of laundry. Now I know how careful I am with my laundry. I make sure that it's full. Why don't we take advertising as seriously as laundry? Why don't we make sure that we are thinking consciously when we do activate a campaign about what's the best way to activate it and minimize that carbon footprint, really? Here, here. Uh, well said. Personally, I don't do laundry, so I'm. I don't <laughs> Thank you so much, panelists.